Here at Paddy Power, we're the home of the Money Back Special, with some incredible offers every single week. Check out the website or app today. Terms and conditions apply. 18 plus, begumbleaware.org. Hello and welcome to this Bank Holiday Monday postcast. I'm Maddie Plow, joining the studio by Nick Watts, and we have Tom Nugent on the line from Paddy Power 2. Of course, we're going to look back on York during this postcast. So much high quality action to review. We're going to take our pick of it and see what the lads think. We're also going to have a look at some of the action midweek from the likes of Tipperary and the Curra Sandown, and the Solario Stakes is on Saturday, of course. So that's what we've got to look ahead to. Um, but first, as I mentioned, let's get started with York. York. We're going to go through some of the sort of higher profile races um, and then I'll give you guys a chance to sort of interject wherever you like. Um, let's start off with the Great Voltager then and Logician who seems to have smashed the St Ledger market sort of right up his street I guess Tom. I mean he, he looks the only real live sort of certain contender at the minute. Yeah, well, he, he's, he's seven to four favourite from sevens after the performance in York, but I there's probably I don't know. There's still you wouldn't know what's lurking in Bally Doyle uh, with with the the ledger in mind. But yeah, he's six to four at the top of it. Uh, Japan is eight to one second favourite alongside Sir Dragon A and Il Paradiso, who coincidentally ran a blinder in York as well. Uh, and there's a, a whole host of them there on tens. But yes, yeah, seven to four favourite logician. Yeah, it's sort of him and then a whole host of, as you say, Japan and, and Bally Doyle's horses. We don't know what they're going to saddle in the race just yet. Maybe something could come out of the woodwork. How impressed were you with uh, the grey? He's a beautiful looking horse and he's unbeaten still. Yeah, impressed. Uh, whilst he still was like, he was a 10 to 11 favourite in a four in a five runner race. So, uh, like, obviously he did it well and did what he was asked for and it's still a group two, but um, I don't know, I'd... I'd, I'd think he's short at the moment um even though he is unbeaten he looks uh, just a, a touch short to me now okay do you think he could be vulnerable in at all what are the chinks in his armor potentially I'm just, uh, you never know in a, in a ledger it's a, it's a it is going to be a firm test there'd be all sorts of pace angles Baddy doyle could run as many as you like in it you wouldn't know um so look he's still got another question to answer obviously he's an extremely good horse he's now a group two winner but again five runners 10 to 11 favorite like he'd want to be doing that uh do you know what i mean but look time will tell yeah exactly uh what's he what are your thoughts on logician people seem to be not getting carried away but there's plenty to like about him you know he's He's a bit sexy, isn't he? He's, you know, he's by Frankel. He's a grey. He's John Gosden. Well, he's the Tory. Yeah, he's um, yeah, he, he he looked very good, but I thought it was a it was a winnable race. Um, you know, Norway was put in there to set the fractions, and I'm not sure Constantinople is. Um, he's a bit of a, a bit. Yeah, of I wouldn't place, be surprised to see him in um, Joseph's yard come the winter, um, doing another job, um, and, and giving that a go. I I I don't see him as a. You know, beating him as as being anything amazing. Yeah, he looked great. I, I'm not even sure if they're going to go. I remember postponed winning the Voltiger a few years ago in really impressive style, and he didn't even go to the ledger because they saw him as a fantastic middle distance prospect, and and that's what he turned out to be. And I wouldn't be surprised if Logician was exactly the same. So, um, if he goes, then obviously he's the rightful market leader, and. I would have thought we'll probably come on to Japan in a minute, but I, th I would have thought that his win at York probably rules him out of this because he might have other fish to fry. Um, and yeah, it'll be a you know it'll all be about what Aiden brings over. I think Anthony Van Dyke might be a likely one. He's got a bit of a reputation to restore, hasn't he? After his last couple of starts, and he hasn't really warranted a crack at the arc or anything like that. And he looks all about stamina, so he might be the one who who, who goes from Aiden's lot, but. I wouldn't be totally surprised if Logician missed this race and, and you know, they took the long-term view with him and a bit like Postpone, like I said, a few years ago. Yeah, OK. So we're not getting too carried away with Logician just that yet then. Uh, what's he? You mentioned Japan there. He's the horse we're going to talk about next. Uh, thrilling Judmont International, Tom. Seems such a long time ago now, but he got the better of Crystal Ocean in, in a great finish. Um I mean, you'd probably say won the race of the week, but so much happened after that that maybe a lot of people have forgotten about it. But he looks a top-class colt now. Yeah, no, it was, it was it was a great week, but yeah, no, it was a fantastic race, and and all credit to Crystal Ocean as well who went down fighting. But Japan looks looks very good. He goes five from ten in Paddy Power's uh, arc market at the moment, so that's a possible target for Japan. Do you think he could beat Enable? 
Uh, he could, um, but I I don't think he will. Um, no, I I I I I think we'll, we'll probably come on to talk to her about her in a bit more detail. But I I just can't see it now. Um, I think she's absolutely incredible. Okay, what do you think of Japan? Did that win surprise you at all? It did slightly. Um, yeah, I mean before the race, I thought uh, you know, I was along with most other people. I thought Crystal Ocean just have enough to hold on. Um, and he went out on his sword as he as he always does. Uh, he, I don't know what to make of Crystal Ocean. He's he's fantastic. Mm. He's so consistent. But you always have a concern that he will prove vulnerable. I mean, he's got a lot of twos next to his name now. He doesn't do anything wrong in his races at all. He tries his absolute heart out. Um, you know, he runs over mile two, mile four. You wonder if that race against the Nabal might have taken a bit out of him at Ascot last time out because, you know, he really put it up to her and he would have, you know, been straining every sinew in that race at Ascot. So to come back a couple of weeks later and fend them all off again, it's not an easy thing to do. I thought if it was a slightly unlucky horse in the race, it might have been the third horse, Elecam, who just when he You're needed... You're a big fan of him, aren't you? Yeah, he was just kind of working up a bit of a head of steam, but he couldn't get out. He couldn't get out when he needed to or get any breathing space. And, you know, Jim Crowley had to stop riding for a couple of strides just to just to enable him to find that kind of route through. And it happened too late for him and he finished on the heels of the leaders in third. I don't think it would have taken a lot for him if he'd managed to get out a bit quicker for him to, to be right on terms with him. And he, he was the one kind of not to take out the race because Japan, obviously, you start with him and, you know, all options are open to him. I wouldn't be surprised to see him in the arc. You wouldn't be surprised to see him, in the, you know, go to Ascot on Champions Day. Irish Champion Stakes, maybe? Quite possibly, but I'd certainly rule out the ledger for him. I cannot see any circumstance with which they would take Japan for a ledger now when he's proved his class mm -hmm. over a mile and two. Um, I don't see any point in that when they've got others in the yard to fulfil the ledger ledger objective. But yeah, I mean, if you're going forward, I think it could be a really interesting rematch between him and Elecam, who's really come of age again this season. Yeah, he certainly has. You mentioned Jim Crowley there. He had an excellent week, of course, but more of that later. Um, usually on these postcasts, we wouldn't cover a sales race in the review, but such is the way that Mum's tipple uh, took the breath away when winning uh, back on earlier in the week. We have to talk about him. Um, Tom, I mean, has he moved in any anti-post markets for that? Yeah, 12's first show for, for the Commonwealth Cup and something similar in the 2,000 guineas. I'll just bring it up there now and double check it. Um, he is, yeah, 14's from 20's in the 2,000 guineas. Absolutely incredible. I'm not a fractions expert, but uh, I would I would be a believer in, in kind of uh, what, the, what the clock would tell us. And, and apparently his... His sections are absolutely incredible. So, uh, look, time will tell. But uh, at the moment, very exciting. But uh, as you say, it's a sales race, so he needs to kind of go kick on and, and do something else now at the end of the season. But, uh, yeah, very, very exciting horse going forward. Yeah, sure is. There's sort of, I think there's two different camps when we look at this race. The sort of time and sectional boys who are going, wow, that's the best juvenile performance we've seen this season. Or there's people who are going, it's a sales race. People might be getting a little bit carried away. Where do you stand? I suppose it's difficult not to get a bit carried away, isn't it? Whenever you see a horse win oh, like 100%. that and, and you put, you know, lengths on your rivals, uh, you know, they might not have been an exceptional bunch. And I think Tom's right. You'd like to see him do it in an autumn race as well uh, to truly kind of gauge where he's at at the moment. But I mean, I would go back to his maiden win as well. That had a lot of substance to it as well. And I yeah. think there was a horse at York, Molotham, who, who came from that maiden too. And I think the top four have come out and won since then. So... You know, when maidens work out like that, they tend to be good. He's, he's shown again on his second start that he obviously is is very talented. And, you know, if he was pitched into one of those big autumn races, the group races for two-year-olds, then um, it'll be very interesting to see how he goes. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd take a po positive view of the performance. So, I'd, I'd, you know, sometimes these things are too good to be true, but I think he deserves to be pitched into a, into a big autumn race. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if he could hold his own and, and, and possibly even end the season unbeaten. Yeah, I think in there to the whole thing as well is that he carried a penalty he carried a five pound penalty in the race so and to give everything weight and still do what he did like it's all well and good for something to go off and just bolt up and kind of you don't ever hear them again but i think the combination of weight and time is very significant and he could be quite good 
Yeah. Richard Hamden, of course, he had threats win another smart juvenile uh, during the week as well. We'll talk about some of the other younger horses to win a bit later on, but I think he's got big plans for both of them. It was quite funny, actually. I was speaking to Charlie Fellows uh, yesterday for our Monday jury, and he described him as Frankalesque. And I thought, whoa, people are going to get upset about that. But he, he was very, very impressive, Mum's tipple. Um, another horse who impresses, she always does, was, of course, in Nabel. When winning the Yorkshire Egg, she beat Magical again and uh, Tom I don't know about you but I thought that the aftermath was as sort of touching as the race itself because that was her last run on British soil we think and Frankie de Tori, he was in tears yeah no look she's obviously an incredibly special filly um, and is four to five at the top of, of the arc market now but that's irrelevant I think in the context of racing and and history and and people looking for that kind of horse of a lifetime you hear i think the aussies are very good about always talking about a mccoy bd a far lap uh, i think and and winks of course but enable is that now i think uh i think she's she's carved out a place for herself in the record books and, and she's she's just an absolutely incredible mare like there was a, a flitter where we were watching it in the office just a fleeting moment where we were like oh hang on a second but then she just turned on the afterburners and and does what she always does and just win well and she's just incredible really absolutely incredible um but yeah amazing to be alive to see it unfold yeah exactly and i think we all echo those sentiments what's i mean in terms of what we learned we didn't learn a great deal you know she didn't have to improve or do anything fancy it wasn't that sort of show-stopping performance but ironically she she is magical every time she runs isn't she it's that effect she has yeah i think having built up that sequence now and having done it on so many different kinds of tracks you know left-handed right-handed uphill downhill and having gone to america last season done that haven't been to france twice done that you know she's really traveled and you know um twitter ties itself in knots about uh, comparing her to frankel and all this kind of stuff i think you know the two are different and, and frankel pulverized his opponent she doesn't do it in quite the same style but in terms of longevity in terms of her being able to travel to different destinations and produce exactly the same kind of performance uh, you know season in season out is just a, a, an exceptional feat and you know she is important for racing to have horses like that she featured in the news bulletin i was watching the news that night on bbc and she actually featured on there That's fantastic. Now, horse racing very rarely does that it takes a, a big horse racing story uh, to feature in the news and often it can be a negative one too so the fact that it was a positive story about a brilliant racehorse about the the showman that is Frankie de Tori that was on board who was in tears uh, is fantastic and you know god willing we get her to France um, you know as Tom said I'd, I don't think you know the price isn't going to float your boat particularly but I think the fact that she's going there as, as a potential three-time arc winner and the the buzz and the noise around that race in the, in the first weekend of October will be brilliant for the game and it'll be fantastic for us all to, to see how she gets on and, you know, I hope she does it. Mm. I don't want to be being picky here, but some people are saying, oh, she's not quite as explosive as she was in her three-year-old season. Um, do you buy into that? Do you think she's just as good or is she getting a bit wise to it now oh, she's getting it's, older? It's, it's completely irrelevant, to be honest. You know, she, she finds a way to win. She's she's probably learned. The, the, the reason horses can... Uh, build up sequences like she has is the probably that you know maybe they do keep a little bit back for themselves she isn't flashy like frankel was you know she won't go and win by five or ten lengths she'll go and do what's necessary and that's why you're able to reproduce the performances time in time out and that's what's enabled her to um you know overcome injury like she did last season come back win at kempton go mm. to the arc win that go to america do that and Everyone this season has kind of wanted to take her on. They wanted to take her on in Eclipse, but she just does what she does. They wanted to take her on the next time at Ascot. She just does it. And, you know, I'm, I'm really not particularly concerned whether she wins by a length or five lengths. It doesn't matter. The fact is that she's built up a brilliant sequence of wins and, you know, that can't be taken away from her. And I don't think it should be. Yeah. Certainly not. You know, I'm sure lots of people would agree with that. We're talking about sequence of wins. Another horse who's built up a really strong sequence is, of course, Stradivarius, who won the Lonsdale, his second million pound bonus. Isn't it funny? When this was first introduced, people said, oh, no one's ever going to win it. And he's now done it twice, Watson. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of similar sentiments you echo about him, you say about Enable. He's, he's certainly not flashy. Um, again, he won by a small margin. Um, at York but again he's running over staying trips which will always you know 
it may not look like it, but it will always take something out of a horse. And the fact that he just wins by small margins, again, suggests that maybe he just keeps a little bit back for himself, does what's necessary. And that's what enables him to go through the season, going from Ascot to Goodwood to York, winning all these big long distance races. And, um, you know, I mean, I suppose the, the naysayers would say that he's beating the same horses and DXB turned up again and got beaten again. And maybe, you know, it's not a very deep pool. Um, but again, that's just, I, I think that's a bit negative to look at it like that. It's, I, I think to win these races, it's not easy. And for him to build up the sequence that he has done, um, mm. you know, is, is, is very praiseworthy and he's the top of the tree at the moment. And again, long may he continue. And let's hope we see him ask it on, um, on Champions Day. Yeah, as you say, we'll see him next year as well. Fingers crossed that he stays sound. Uh, Tom, I'm, I'm a mix between sort of the two things what he's mentioning that I admire this horse he's brilliant but I'd just like to see something a bit different from him now and you know he's unlikely to go to the arc but I I want some fresh opposition or I want him to travel or I don't know do you where do you sort of side on the Stradivarius issues I I see where you're coming from but I think you're possibly being overly harsh i think i think he's probably one of the great stairs of the, of the modern era i would say um he, he's kind of he, he just does enough okay yeah he's beaten the same opposition but a bit like any good kind of football team or whatever he can win in style or win ugly it doesn't matter he just wins and gets it done and, and i think that's probably the biggest compliment i can pay him he just is an, an incredible horse and it like it, as you say about that stayers bonus thing and, and people were thinking oh it was never going to happen I, I think that's something that's a policy that i think the, the powers that be weather bees etc kind of need to stick behind for it's going to take five years plus of kind of breeding industry to be influenced to maybe consider breeding a stare to kind of go for those targets particularly the owner breeder so I, I, it's a fantastic initiative and and uh, things like the million pound ebor help as well but uh yeah no i i think stradivarius himself is is a fantastic stare and uh I, I, I wouldn't have him crabbed. I won't have it. I won't listen to it. <laughs> hey, I'm just doing this in the interest of balance. I, I really like the horse. He is, he's a bit of a legend really now, isn't he? Um, from one end of the distance spectrum to the other, we'll go to the Nunthorpe and Batash. He blew them away. New course record. Bye-bye, Deja. And he banished those York doubts. What's he? Yeah, he did a uh, fantastic performance. It wasn't one that I was expecting. I, I was on the show last week and I was saying much rather be with, with Aidan's horse, who was very disappointing as it turned out. Sovereigns, yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, it, you know, it's great. And it's kind of, because he's a gelding, it gives them the freedom to go for these kind of things because co commercial considerations aren't a factor for him. So the fact that he's failed twice, you know, in it other circumstances. It was brave though, didn't it? For connections to go, oh, we're not going to wait for some other target. We're going to give it one last go and it paid off. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of brave, but like I said, because he is a gelding, it gives them the freedom to be able to do things like that because they've got no, you know, worries about, you know, future breeding or anything like mm. that. So they can roll the dice as, as many times as they like. And and this time it worked at to absolute perfection. And, you know, I think what is worthy of praise is the way Charlie Hills has trained his horse because obviously, it, you know, it, he must be very headstrong, and, and especially in his younger days. I mean, they had him gelded quite early on, so um, presumably it was hard to control. Um you know, always had the speed, but he had to kind of channel it into the right areas and all that kind of stuff. And that's sometimes been his downfall. Um, I think this race worked out absolutely perfect for him because Ornate always blasts off from the front and, it, you know, he's just able to sit in behind and use that mm. brilliant cruising speed. And 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 then, you know, um, the race absolutely panned out perfect, perfectly for him. Um, so it showed that there's no demons in the track whatsoever. Um, it shows that he's settled down mentally. Uh, because he's a gelding, like I said, I think we'll see him for a few good more years yet because there's no um, incentive to retire him at this stage, they might as well keep going. And I think they'll be very, very keen. I, I kind of think the last horizon for them is Royal Ascot, because that is the one place that's beaten him so far. Maybe it's that stiff final furlong, I don't know, but um, Blue Point's always just had his measure at Ascot. But they'll get another crack at the whip, hopefully, next summer. And if he can win if he can win a King's Stand to go alongside a Nunthorpe in the Abbey, then, you know, I mean, he is already in the top echelons of sprinters, of course. And like you said, he, he beat the course record at York, so absolutely fantastic. But I think the cherry on the cake for connections will be a Royal Ascot win for him. Yeah, Tom, I mean, it was hard to believe that that was just his second Group 1 win. People are talking about him as, you know, one of the, the fastest horses we've seen in an awful long time. And hopefully now he can really start to keep that consistency, whatever track he's running at. 
Yeah, I, I think a big thing for those sprinters is a bit of maturity and a bit of age. You can often see before the likes of the Commonwealth Cup came along, the kind of three and four year old sprinters often fell off the radar a little bit and kind of came back on the scene when they kind of hit five. But Hash is, is a five year old now, which is actually a scary thing. Five year old Gelding, he's got a number of seasons under still left in him. Please God, if he stays sound, and uh, yeah, he's got the best is yet to come. I think from Patash. he's becoming a little bit more reliable now. I would have been very much of the opinion that. He generally went off very short. Uh, I think on his five runs last season, he was odds on in three of them, and a kind of he's, he's generally favoured or very short in the market, and just found himself found a way to get beaten often. Um, but but this year he's shown a bit more a bit more consistency. Only the beaten only beaten the once in his four runs, as you say, just second to Blue Point in Royal Ascot. So shown a little bit more maturity, shown a bit more professionalism, and uh, yeah, the best is yet to come from him. Very exciting going forward. Mm, it certainly is. So we'll get on to the feature of the week then, the £1 million e-ball won by Mustajir in pretty emphatic style, I thought, ultimately, Tom. Uh, Ger Lyons, of course, the, the prize went back to Ireland. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely bolted up, to be honest. Uh, still to be seen what the plan is obviously kind of Ebor everyone thinks now or oh, the Melbourne Cup is kind of the next step but uh, I, think I think he's been bought by Australian bloodstock hasn't he in, in in a fair share so I think he will go that way yeah well if that that is the if that is the case he, he goes into the uh, to the Melbourne Cup, uh, Cup market at 16 to 1 but yeah no it was, it was a great performance nonetheless and and uh, very very impressive caught me completely off guard now to be honest but uh, yeah no we did it well yeah I mean f- Fifth in the race last year, I think, wasn't he? Fourth, 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 yeah. fourth yeah, I stand corrected. And uh, some good runs this season. What, so he was one of mine for the race, but then I sort of plumped with Raheem House, who total no-show, so that was a bit frustrating. But I think such a good race, wasn't it? And he just, I thought it was really easy. Yeah, it was. He, he did it very comfortably. It's, it's funny how these things work out. Um, Tom Seagull um, was just talking in the weekend uh, uh, last week about Cotting Keane. He tipped Keen. him anti-post, of course, and Desert Skyline. Tipped him anti-post and Desert Skyline. It's a fantastic result for him. And he was just uh, eulogising about Cotting Keane last week, saying what a fantastic jockey he is. And, um, you know, he argues that he's the best around at the moment. And hey, presto, he goes and win the, wins the big Saturday race on, on, on Mr. G. Yeah, no, fantastic result, fantastic win, 600 grand in the pocket, so so great for great for connections. Um, there was a couple of luck, hard luck stories in behind. You always get them in, in big oh. fields like that. I thought Bar Santi was a bit unlucky not to finish closer. Um, he got held up a couple of times, finished with a bit of a rattle, but I think they would have all had to go some to beat Mr. G. He was a really good winner on the day. Yeah, I mean, I was speaking to Nile O'Reilly on Saturday. He was really keen on Raymond Tusk, and he got a Jamie Spencer special, whichever way you want to slice it. Um, he was very unlucky. I think you'd be frustrated if you backed him, so our commiserations are with Nile anyway. Um, before we move on uh, and we look ahead to the midweek action, let's just quickly have a chat about some of the juveniles. We've not mentioned Val de Moro living in the past... We also had action from uh, Ireland as well, Armoury and Alpine Star when the two Group 2s over there and then Threat and Alligator Alley as well. Who were you most impressed by? What's the out of that bunch, do you think, if we ignore Mum's tipple? Yeah, no, I, I think the Irish races might have had more significance long term than, than the ones at York last week. Um, you know, Threat won nicely, but I think he's, to me he just seems like a workman-like kind of horse uh, who eventually will find his level, maybe... I don't see him as a potential Guineas winner at the moment, put it that way. Um, I thought the Irish races on the whole last week, um, particularly Armoury, is looking very good indeed. And, you know, I, I think long term they would have more significance than, than maybe the York winners. Living in the past won nicely, but again, I, you know, unless she takes a leap forward in the autumn, um, which she may do, you never know. So um, I wouldn't be too... Overly enthused about the York races, but very enthused about the Irish ones last week, I think. Yeah, I'd agree with you. Maybe not that much sort of strength in them. I did like the performance of Valdemora, though. I thought he was um, sort of one in the manner of a really nice horse, but it remains to be seen how strong that form is. Uh, Tom, what did you think of the action? Yeah, I was very impressed with uh, Armory now, I have to say. I think his, his season has been kind of a, a, a slowly, gently approach, but uh, it's coming together quite nicely now. And uh, I, I was very impressed with him. I thought he was the one to take out of all the uh, all the two-year-old action over the weekend. And he's second favourite now for the 2,000 guineas for next season. Armory 10-1 uh, in behind Pinatubo. 
Fantastic. As promised, we'll take a break now. But if you want to get your hands on the Racing Post data to study ahead of those classics or indeed for the weekend, then make sure you join our Members Club. Everything you could ever want in that package. We'll see you in a moment. What's my horse's handicap? The fact that you're backing him. Everyone loves a newbie. That's why Paddy Power Games are giving all new customers 60 free spins on daily jackpot games. New Paddy Power Games customers only. One per customer. T's and C's apply. 18 plus. BeGambleAware.org. Welcome back to this Monday postcast. We're going to look at some of the action midweek now. And uh, a lot of it's Irish dominated this week. On Thursday at Tipperary, the 6.25 is the Coolmore Stud Fairy Bridge Stakes, a Group 3 for the Phillies and Mares over 7.5 furlongs. Last year, it was won by one master who went on to win the Prix de la Forêt, a Group 1, of course, so could well be worth following, Tom. And uh, we've got another high-profile name in here in that Skitter Scatter could be returning. Yeah, she's she's entered here and uh, in the car on Friday, so it'll be interesting to see where she shows up. A lot of people waiting for her return. But there is a filly here, one of Paddy Toomey's, called Silk Forest, that won in Leopardstown a couple of weeks ago. She's a Kodiak filly, and I thought she was very, very good. And uh, she'd be one to keep on side here if she does get a run. Worth noting that I think English horses uh, that are brought over for these type of races, particularly the two... Uh, group uh, the, the group race and the listed race in Tipperary on, on Thursday night generally have quite a good record as these kind of level of, of races a lot of the decent horses at that level in Ireland get sold at this time of the year um, and, and end up leaving the country and so it can be sometimes a depleted kind of population so it's it's there for the picking in terms of, of, of depth for some of those English horses so keep an eye out for some of those that do come over Good point. Very, very good point indeed. Interesting that some of them are sold at that point. Uh, what's the, yeah, it was a, a good race last year and who took your eye this time around? Well, obviously Tom's already mentioned Skitter, Skitter Scatter. It'll be interesting to see how she goes. Uh, no run since uh, she turned up for the 1,000 guineas and she only beat one home then. I'd put, I certainly wouldn't want to be taking a short price about her. Um, mm. I don't know how she'll be priced up. I imagine she'll start favourite on account of what she did as a two-year-old and you know, she's back to her best, she'll probably win. But there is that big question mark there that she hasn't been seen all over the summer and she is making kind of... An overly big filly either, is she? Yeah, it's a bit of a belated return, isn't it? And obviously things went awry for her in the spring. Um, she must have had a little niggle or something or maybe just been left off for a while to, to find herself. But um, yeah, there's a horse in there who has been winning lately, might might run well, is surrounding. Uh, one last two starts, one of... You know, group three at Fairy House and a listed race at Galway, uh, much more recent form, which is what you want to see. And I'd rather take that on board than, than a horse returning after a long absence, even though she did, you know, show a huge amount of class as a two-year-old. Yeah, indeed. Injured herself behind Hermosa in that 1,000 guineas at Newmarket. Will be good to see Skitter scatter back anyway. Fingers crossed she appears in one of these races we're going to look at. The 6.55 is the race Tom's already mentioned. It's the Abergwarn Stakes. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. A listed race over the five furlongs. And again, some classy sprinters entered up here. The likes of Hit the Beard, Sergei Prokofiev. Tom, uh, just want to touch on him because they seem to hold him in really high regard as a juvenile and even at the start of this year. But things just haven't really happened for him. Him. Yeah, he put in some very good performances as a juvenile, well, but as you say, just hasn't really gone to plan this season. Um, whatever about English horses coming over and kind of uh, being quite successful in those uh, three-year-old and up uh, kind of group three races, particularly in sprints, the Irish uh, sprinting division is isn't the strongest, and and this looks right for the picking for for an English horse as well. Um, the one I liked here was the Intense Romance for Michael Dodds. Now it hasn't quite inspired, wouldn't inspire you with its two runs so far this season. But um, the ground at the moment in Tipperary, according to the Racing Post website, is described as uh, heavy. Now, we did have quite a dry weekend here, so that might dry it out a little bit. But Intense Romance, uh, the Intense Focus Mare, she's, she likes uh, an old dig in the ground, looking at her form from last season. So uh, she could be one to keep an eye on. Yeah, I must admit, I'm a really big fan of hers. And you're right, if that rain does fall and it is soft ground, she will absolutely love that. So I'm in agreement with you on Intense Romance. So, What's he? I mean, we'll go back to Sergei Prokofiev because we've seen him in some of our contests over here. I think he ran behind Mab's Cross in the Palace House at the start of the season. I mean, he's a bit of a funny one, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He, he can look good on occasions and he's obviously got, you know, a lot of speed. Um, this is a bit of a crossroads race for him for me because his last two runs have been disappointing. Now, they dropped him in the levels. You know, this is down to a listed race here for him and you'd think he'd be competitive. But... 
you know, he might want, not want the ground two testing either. Um, so whether he actually turns up or not, we haven't got the, you know, final decks as we speak at the moment. So have to watch that one to see if he's actually entered or not. But another disappointing run and you'd kind of be tempted to put him on the swerve list, you know, because he hasn't quite achieved what we thought he might do at one stage. Um, you did mention hit the bed, hit the bid. He would be, a, you know, more interesting one for me. He had, does have an absence to overcome. I don't mm. think he's run since Maidan in March, but he was a very close second in this race last season. So I don't know if this has been the plan to reintroduce him in this race and because he's got good track form, good course form uh, and, and ran so well in it last year, he would be of interest for me. But, um, you know, I'd like to see the fine make up of the final field before, you know, yeah. committing really. Yeah, as you say, hit the bit of regular at the Maidan Carnival. Really talented sprinter on his day. Maybe this could be um, one for him to pick up or maybe it'll be a prep for other things. On Friday, we have the 6.20 at the Curra. It's the Snow Fairy Philly Stakes, a Group 3 over a mile and one furlong. Again, no confirmations here, but some really interesting entries. Um, Tom, I mean, is there a horse here you think stands out as someone who could be favourite? It's a good little race, this. Um, I would say this will probably will revolve around whether Red T runs or not for Joseph. Um, I'd say she might be close enough to the top of the betting. Um, she is the highest on ratings at the moment uh, on 108. But the one I thought might be worth taking a chance with again was uh, uh, Richard O'Brien's Dean Street doll, who got a lot of tongues wagging when she finished second in the uh, 1000 Guineas trial at Leopard Sound earlier in the year. Now ran in the Curra and finished fifth. Um, but, but then stepped up to 10 furlongs in a list address last day and was eased down. Um, so obviously they have her kind of some way right again. Um, and if she runs here, she could be, she could be interesting. She, she looked quite a talented filly early in the season and, uh, she could be, she could be one to keep on side. Yeah. Fantastic. You mentioned some others there. I'll run through the ones I've wrote down just randomly. I had Goddess, who was impressive last time, Encapsulation, who now is trained by Andrew Boulding, uh, Rawdar as well. And, and what's the one I thought was quite interesting was Um Alnar for William Haggis. He does quite well in these Irish races and um, progressive filly and won quite nicely last time. So I'd be interested to see if she turned up at least. What did you think? Yeah, there's a few interesting British ones. And um you know, Tom makes a really good point. That it's, probably, it's probably a good time to to come over if you've got a British trained runner. Show a bit of imagination and get them entered in these races because it can, you know you can win some decent pots and and they've certainly done that this week. Um, Raw Dar was one that I thought was quite interesting. Uh, I thought we ran quite well in at Goodwood last time in the Nassau behind Deirdre, finished third. Got a few places to her name, um, banging her head against a brick wall a little bit at the top, at the highest level, but dropping down to a Group Three from a Group One last time. It's the sort of race that she could easily win and get involved in and get off the mark for the season. So it could be a really good option for her. But like we said, early days in the week, we haven't got final decks at the moment. But if Rawdar went, then I, I think it would be a good opportunity for her. Yeah, really consistent at this sort of level. Rawdar, she deserves a win, doesn't she? Um, we won't go into any great detail, but the big race we have to look forward to on Saturday is, of course, the Solario Stakes at Sandown. It's at 2.25, Group 3 over seven furlongs. Won in recent years. I mean, two darn hot last year. We had Massa, we had Kingman, Ravens Pass before that. So it's acted as a really good stepping stone in the last couple of seasons to big race success. And um, the entries have just come out. I mean, we have the likes of Al Suhail, Kamiko, Visionari, Thunderous Positive will be rep representing that. Uh, Pinatubo form, of course, from Goodwood. So it'd be interesting to see who finally turns up, Tom. And uh, do you think this race is, is one to keep an eye on with regards to a future star? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think I think we've we've kind of seen a lot of decent form lines come out of the Solario Stakes. Of course, Massar won it a couple of years ago, and Romanized ran in behind him. So, like, it it definitely produces quality, and uh, yeah, definitely want to keep an eye on. Yeah, well, see, I mean, as you say, these entries have just come out, so we haven't had a chance to have a real good look at them yet. But it's got a good pedigree this race, and. I'm excited for it. You've hit the nail on the head. You can easily be blindsided in weeks like this because it's very quiet generally. We've just come off the back of a major festival and kind of just take your eye off the ball a little bit. But as you mentioned, it'd be unwise to do that because the Solari has produced some fantastic horses. We only have to look back, you know, to like you mentioned them too darn hot and uh, Massar and uh, Raven's Pass. So it could throw up something good. Um, Al Sahel, I thought would be quite interesting. Uh, Visionari is a very interesting horse because you were talking about the figures boys earlier in the program and they were actually, you know, going mental after Visionari won on debut at Newmarket. Um, there's been a, looked a kind of big, kind of awkward horse that needs a bit of time since then and maybe it's all happening a bit too quick for him. But 
you know, they were adamant back then that this horse is, is absolute mustard. So maybe it'll give him an opportunity to, to get back on track. Who knows? But definitely a race to, uh, you know, the old cliche set the video recorder for and make sure you, you tune in and watch it. Mm, exactly. I'm sure many people are going to be interested in how Al Sahel gets on. You spoke about him, a really, really impressive Yarmouth winner last time, but plenty of others promising in there as well. Bruce and the team will be back on Friday to have a look at that in more detail as well as the rest of the Saturday and ITV cards, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Check out Paddy's Rewards Club. Simply place five bets of £10 or more across any sport in a week and you'll get a free £10 bet then next week. TNC Supply, 80 plus, begumbleaware.org. Welcome back to this final instalment of the Friday Postcast. Now, we've looked at some of the Irish action midweek, but I'm going to spin you through the meetings now. Uh, tomorrow, we have Epsom, Rip and Bath, Musselburgh, Ballin Robe. Wednesday is Lingfield, Musselburgh, Catherick, Bellustown, Worcester and Kempton. Thursday is Fosslass, Chelmsford, Carlisle, Bellustown, Fontwell, Sedgefield and Tipperary. And Friday is Bangor on Dee, Thirsk, Sandown, Wolverhampton, Hamilton, Newcastle and The Curra. Now, before we get the naps, what's your know you've only got a nap this week so I'm hoping it's going to be good. Uh, Tom what do you think? I mean there's some good racing at Ballon Robe tomorrow. The likes of Moon over Germany reappearing against uh, Ordinary World and horses like that. Yeah, that's a that's a great little race actually. But uh, my next best bet of the week is in Tipperary actually on Thursday night in the five twenty five. There's a filly at Dermot Wells called Florence Camille, who finished uh, third in Cork on her debut, and I thought she'd take a uh, she that was something to build on, and she'd take a good step forward. So I think she is the most likely winner on, on uh, Tipperary on Thursday the five twenty five if she runs. Fabulous. Thanks very much for that, Tom. And we will get those naps as promised now. This will not be beaten. I'm very intrigued, Watsy. Take it away. Yeah, there's a horse running at Sandown on Friday in the 350 called Tempus. Um, comes from a really, really good family. Uh, damn, Passage of Time was a Group 1 winner in her in her racing career. Um, produced Time Test. I think he was a very good horse as well for Roger Charlton. Um, really, really good line, good pedigree. Um, running in a handicap off 91. Uh, one last two starts, one at Haydock last time out. Uh, I'd be amazed if uh, if Tempest didn't prove better than the handicapper in time. So should be winning off 91 on Friday. Yeah, it's interesting. You see that? I'd, he caught my eye as well. I think he's had a bit of a break, hasn't he? And Roger Charlton, he's superb with these horses, isn't he? So sure, Tempest will be one to keep an eye on for the future. And Tom, your nap. Uh, yeah, Care uh, in the 4.40 in Bellustown on Thursday. Uh, she won a Roscommon bumper um, on her third start and then was going very well in the Maiden Hurdle in the Galway at the Galway Festival uh, when coming down, but she won her Maiden Hurdle in uh, Sligo uh, on the 20th of August, uh, winning very, very well, and she's in in the 4.40 in Bellustown on Thursday, and I think she could go very, very well. Fantastic. Thanks to Watsy and to Tom for their contributions today. Just a reminder, before we leave you to download the Racing Post app, it's got all you need on there, all the race cards, exclusive sign-up offers from the bookmakers. No need to leave the app if you wanted to have a bet, so make sure you get hold of that if you haven't already. That's it for today. As I mentioned, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe, and we'll see you soon. Paddy Power Games has over 250 of your favourites to play online, and we're going to attempt to name them all in this 10-second ad before the T's and C's kick in. There's Blackjack, 18 plus,